Good morning, Andrea. Hi, Ray. <laughs> How you doing? I'm good. How are you? Good. I have to tell you that I'm recording, right? That's California state law. Oh, wow. Interesting. Mm -hmm. You didn't know that? No. I mean, I can see it's recording right here, so. But well, thank you. <laughs> well, I know in New York, you don't have to tell people. For some reason, I thought that was only for phone calls, but um, video, yeah, that would make sense. I think it's just recording and stuff. Yeah. So this could be admitted as evidence in a court of law. <laughs> right. Good to know. If I admit to any crimes that I've committed. Right. <clears throat> but if I didn't tell you re recording, then we couldn't admit it. Inadmissible. Inadmissible. What a great word. <laughs> So tell me, tell me about all that stuff you're studying. Um, well, God, where to begin? I well, feel like I'm trying to be, are you trying to be a detective? Are you trying to be a cop? Are you trying to be a lawyer? Are you trying to be an autopsy person? So the tough thing is like my interest is so broad in like all of that field, like I'm interested in forensic science. I'm interested in like detective work. I'm interested in like all different kinds of like aspects of criminal justice. And then there's also this other side that I'm like really into like pathology and the whole aspect of like mortuary sciences. So I'm, I'm literally at this kind of crossroads right now where I, I have to decide if I'm gonna go a criminal justice route or if I'm going to stick with just forensic science and there's so many factors involved like if you go forensic science route it's much harder you know you basically are majoring in chemistry or biology but then the the umbrella that it covers is like really wide-ranging so you can kind of do anything you could be a fingerprint technician you could do all kinds of stuff work in a lab toxicology whatever um, and then you can also do like crime scene investigating, I mean, <clears throat> and all that stuff, but, um, it's just, it's a lot of schooling. So, you know, so it's like, do, how much longer can I see myself going to school? And it's tough. It's like really hard, like, um, school work. I don't know. It's, um, it's a lot sometimes, but. I'm just kind of taking it one step at a time. I'm like, I try not to think about this big grand picture, like, oh, I have to pick one thing right now. Like, I'm kind of just trying to go with the flow and just being like, is this making me happy right now? Like, am I enjoying it? Um, you, have to do the, you have to do the basic classes first anyways <clears throat> to do any of those things, right? Yeah, yeah. But it's like, if you go criminal justice route, you're more studying like sociology and psychology and all these different things, yeah. <clears throat> you know, like crime rates and how, um you know women in crime and all these different like factors and like policing like how does policing work and you're kind of learning about like police management and all this stuff so you can kind of work on like the law aspect of it um mind hunting yeah exactly <laughs> i know forensic psychology sounds really interesting um but but yeah, I'm at this crossroads. And then I'm doing this internship where I'm like working as an autopsy technician. And like, that's really fun, super interesting, really wild. Like, so all of a sudden this like criminal justice route, like I want to be a detective, you know, like working for the FBI and just like being a spy, like, you know, that whole. <laughs> being a spy. <laughs> um, like, now all of a sudden. Like you put on a disguise. No, that's not real. People, I mean, I guess they do like when you go like, like you have to like fake identity and enter another country and try to get doesn't that doesn't that sound fun to you yeah it does but in the in, if i was in a movie <laughs> yeah for sure i don't think somebody like me could really do that just the way i look is too too obvious well you'd have to that's like a military operation right yeah for sure that's like some <clears throat> some like higher F echelon like fbo oh, undercover though that's a different thing yeah. Like you could be undercover FBI, but I don't think you could be a spy in the FBI. That's more like CIA, right? I yeah. don't know. I just want to be Pretty much that's like the gist of it. Yeah. You think you could go undercover as like, uh, I don't know, some kind of like 
cartel, drug cartel, kind of undercover type thing? Is that? <laughs> no, never. Oh. I would be too scared, wouldn't you? Yeah. You I have, would blow it. I'm not good at that. You have too many tats, huh? They'd be like, no. Yeah. I think you have to have kind of like a certain look that's like very malleable. Like we could work with this. We could make this person look this way or this way. And for me, it's kind of just like one and done lightweight. <laughs> Well, tell me about, so you cut someone's chest, a dead person's chest open. A bunch of times. Oh my God. Yeah. How does that, how's that? It's, let me just give you a little background. Okay. The first day that I went in for, I just went in to do a tour. I was like, met this woman, Dr. Judy Melanick. She's amazing. She wrote a book called Working Stiff with her husband and it's incredible she's so amazing and i saw that she was going to do a talk at city college i you know i saw her name like on the docket of people we had like swat team members come in and all these different people in law enforcement come in and do like presentations in our in our class and i saw her name and i recognized it from this book and i was like oh my god i'm so hyped because she um she was living in New York. She was working at the, as the medical examiner in New York City. So I thought she still lived there. Long story short, she came to the class and, you know, did this presentation. And I got to talk to her after the class. Her and her husband were there. And, and I brought, like, a copy of the book for her to sign it because I'm just, like, so nerdy. And awesome. she was like, oh, you should, you should come do a tour of where I work. I work at the Alameda County Coroner's Bureau. <clears throat> And I was like, yeah, for sure. I'll get like extra credit for like another class if I just like write up a thing, whatever. And so when I got there that morning, she, you know, she was like, meet me here at this time, like just dress professionally, blah, blah, blah. And I get there in the morning. <clears throat> I'm like all nervous, you know, big building. There's like all cops and shit everywhere. Like everyone looks all official, like detectives. They're, they called death investigators there, like within the county. But um, and she was like, oh, actually, you know, we had like a kind of interesting um, homicide last night that I'm about to do the autopsy on. If you want to scrub in, you can work as a scribe for me today. And I'm like, I don't even know what that means, but yes, I want to do it. I don't know what I have to do, but yeah, for sure. And um, so all of a sudden I'm like in this changing room, like putting on these, I'm like, full, take all your clothes off putting on these scrubs and I'm like full suited up. You have like scrubs over your boots, arms, two layers of like arm scrubs, full kit. Wow. Like you look in sand with like a face shield under a mask, like the whole thing, hairnet, full gown with like, it's crazy. You're like fully suited up. And I'm like shaking like, oh my God, what am I and about that, to walk into? And that was just an impromptu invite that wasn't for like school or nothing. Yeah, yeah. It was like while I was there, she did me, she like gave me the whole tour, you know, like this is our offices, like took me upstairs to where the like forensic lab is, like introduced me to the chief and all the death investigators upstairs. She like gave me the tour and then like kind of as things were winding down, she was like, okay, actually I'm about to do this autopsy. Like, do you want to stay? <clears throat> and you're like, show me the body. I mean, it was just such an opportunity that you like kind of couldn't even, I mean, obviously I have like an interest in that. So it was kind of exciting that she invited me, but it's also just like a wild opportunity. When are you going to ever be in that position where like you get to actually see what's going on? It's I've, I, I always have that kind of curious, like rubbernecker in me. That's like always trying to see the like gruesome, like car crash. And like, so for me, that was like kind of exciting, but um, it was, it was totally different than I expected. Like I, when I walked in to the autopsy suite, it's not just like one room. They're doing like one autopsy. They're doing like six at oh. the same time. Oh. So like, so all of a sudden it was just like, ah, <laughs> you walk in, there's like kind of bodies everywhere. And they're just investigating. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think you kind of go into this mindset where you you have to like turn off this switch where you're like these aren't people this is just science this is just 
this isn't real. Like I really, that first day I remember so specifically like walking in and just being like, this isn't real. And it was kind of, it's kind of nice because your face is like mostly covered. Like I think the whole time my jaw was just like open. I was just like, yeah, ah, what the fuck? Like, the whole time. <laughs> it does. It definitely takes a certain kind of person. She was like, you know, it's the, it's the body's natural response to see trauma and feel that it's happening to you. So like a lot of people get sick the first time they like are in an autopsy suite and a lot of people like are just are really affected by it. She said that, um, you know, even some of the like people that work there like were, would get sick in the beginning when they first were like experiencing like being around a dead body. But so it, it kind of, when I first started, I was just working as a scribe there. So I go in, I don't touch anyone there. I stand behind the doctor while she's doing the autopsy and I'm taking all the notes. So as she's going through the autopsy, she's weighing out the organs, she's noting anything. And I'm there with like this big chart, tons of papers, and I'm like marking everything she's telling me to do. Just standing quietly behind her, like making sure not to get in the way. But I think the first time, so after doing that for like a couple months and I went like, you know, a couple times a week in the morning to work as a scribe there and um eventually she was like do you want to train as an autopsy technician basically we would like we have to give you a background check we have to like do all this paperwork and training obviously but basically it would be like my job to go in there and like you help prepare the bodies before the autopsies <clears throat> so like in the morning they get like a list of all the autopsies that are presumably going to be done that day with like a little synopsis written by the death investigator of like um any kind of med medical history anything that was found like on the scene um and just kind of like a brief synopsis of like how the body was found and kind of in what situation so that the doctors like can kind of get a sense like who this person was before they're like going into the autopsy um but they also do a lot of other research. I mean, the doctors are there. They look through all the scene photos beforehand, um, you know, and they'll like talk to the death investigators about anything they need to know before, before they go into the procedures. So you're, um, looking, you're, you're looking for evidence of cause of death. Yeah. All evidence, all possible things, right? Yeah. So it's like, you know, say they get somebody in who's got like, no evidence of you know there was no you know medications no drugs found at the scene they're like a relatively healthy like person like how what how did they die that's like what they're looking for like within the body so it's really interesting um but yeah like so through my training um th there kind of was this switch where all of a sudden it was like I could say, oh, these people aren't real. I, you know, I hadn't touched a body yet for like months. I just was there observing. And you kind of get used to the sight of like the whole thing, you know, and it even it's like gets a little hairy. You like hear the like drills kind of buzzing around and you like try not to look over. But then all of a sudden it was like my turn to do that. Wait a second. Let's step backwards a little bit. Yeah. So you have that impromptu meeting with that lady and she's like coming to the autopsy suite. And then you went back to school and you're like, how do I sign up for that and do that all the time? Or is that, you know, or did you just start working for this lady for fun? I just kind of started working for fun. Wow. Like at City College, they don't have like an autopsy technician program. They, right. they only, we study um, under the window of administration of justice. So to do like pathology assisting which would be like to do the autopsies and assist in that it's like a totally you have to get a bachelor's degree and then do a separate program so you kind of just have to follow on like a forensic science track and then you can also just like volunteer on the side while you're like getting you know educated in that field right okay so i'm kind of i'm tr i'm kind of trying to like build my experience mm before I'm like done with school that way like once I'm done you're even just get a degree um then you can go and be like oh I've, I've been doing this for like this many years you know I already have the experience of doing all this um even though I wasn't technically hired I'm just there as a volunteer um 
it just counts so much, you know, like that hands-on experience really counts for like most of it, like who, you know, great references and like, right. you know, the degrees kind of just, you, that's just like a, you know, you just have to click that box. It's <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. So let's step backwards a little bit on the body side of things at the scene of a crime. There's a, bo there's a body. Mm -hmm. they, okay. Here's a question. I don't know if I saw this where, I don't know where I heard this or saw this and maybe we have talked about this before, but the way they, they can age, Oh, the way they can tell the time of death of a body is by the species of maggots that are in the body. Is that? Yes. Oh. So like at two hours to two days, those are two different. Uh, or yeah, no, you tell me. Yeah. Yeah. That would be, that would be in the realm of forensic entomology where basically they study the larvae of flies to see basically they they age very quickly the larvae of flies so you can kind of tell at what stage they're at how long they've been there and the flies that like like to nest on dead bodies are very good at smelling them so within minutes of somebody dying they can be there oh just laying but <laughs> yeah but that would be in circumstances where like they they really didn't have like any other factors to go on you know um usually they it's it's not always just that reliable like it there's a lot of factors that will skew that like what was the air temperature around where this person died were they like I remember reading about a case, actually, I think it was even in a Forensic Files episode where um, two people died like in an apartment building and they couldn't figure out the timeline because the bodies were like in, in a room that was like, had, the AC was like blasting in this apartment. So it like, it kept their bodies like at a certain point of, um, of like decomposition so they really like couldn't tell like how did how are these people in here for so long and they look like they died yesterday so that's like a factor that really can affect that so it's not always um that reliable but that's also why they have body farms they study all that kind of stuff so they'll leave like a body outside and and study like the rate it was this person clothed does that have a difference were they like in a shady area in uh were they outside were they inside were they in a car were they in were they buried like all different kinds of things so that's that's kind of where they study um so that's, that's that. what happens when you donate your body to science yeah okay so <clears throat> they take the body hose it off or whatever and then it comes to you <laughs> yeah but they don't really hose we we hose the bodies off oh they, just comes straight off the street straight off the street to, straight to you pretty much yes oh, okay <clears throat> like if there's some kind of medical inter like intervention like let's say somebody was shot they're like taken to a hospital and then they die in the hospital then they come to us so they have like evidence of medical intervention on them or they were like brought straight from the scene um the we usually get the bodies unless it's a suspected homicide we usually get the bodies um nude already so wh whoever brings the bodies they take the clothes off bag the bag the clothes and we get the bodies naked um unless it's a homicide that then we go and um document all articles of clothing everything is photographed documented on paperwork and that's like a more of a long process right you do, yeah so that's that part of that forensics is that like is that the same team that does like all the dna like looking for dna evidence and stuff like that we'll send all evidence like upstairs to the lab so like we the only thing we do to identify someone is we take fingerprints in the autopsy suite after the autopsy is done. We document fingerprints and 
just to make sure that this person, oh, even though their wallet says that this was them, this person says that this was them, we make sure on a database that that person was actually that person. So they'll do like DNA samples and stuff um, upstairs in the lab too. Okay. Yeah. I have, I have a lot of questions about this. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> Okay, so like, do you, do you still have to do a full autopsy on someone, for example, if they got shot in the head and they, that obviously killed them? Do you still have to do the, you still have to open their chest cavity? Yeah. Because you never know, like, there's just factors that you need to know. You need to make sure they didn't die of like a heart attack before they bled out. You know what I mean? Like, did they die? Did the gunshot wound cause them to like have a heart attack? You know, like if they were shot in like on the chest somewhere, um, there's just factors that you need to know. Like there, were, we had um, an older decedent come in who was had some kind of like ailments and he was hit by a car and we needed to know there was a lawsuit involved and it was kind of a thing that like one of the parties needed to know like did this person die because of like underlying conditions that were already there or did they die specifically because of this car crash because they ended up l living and then like later dying but it, they didn't know if it was complications from the the injuries sustained from the car crash or if it was like this guy's just old he's got a bad heart etc so there's even if it seems kind of obvious and that's the difference between um, a manslaughter conviction for the driver, right? Um, yeah, I mean, there would be like a whole, um, you have to basically go and find like the body of evidence is what they call it for each crime. So it was like, was there intent? Was it completely an accident? They have to prove all these different things in order to find a conviction for something. Prosecution does. Right um very intense yeah okay so the body comes in just give me the breakdown of a standard autopsy <laughs> like, where do you where does it start where does it end yeah so like like i said in the morning they basically have a list of like five or six autopsies that the doctors are going to be doing that day someday there'll be like three doctors they'll each do like two or three sometimes is like a lot um, or sometimes it's just one. Um, the autopsy technicians, we get there earlier and we kind of set up the station. So when we get into the autopsy suite, it's fully cleaned from the night before. And we basically have to set up the stations for the doctor. So each doctor kind of has like an area that they like to work in. Um, and we'll kind of like swap out the bodies like after the autopsy is done we'll kind of get the next one ready for them um you know while they're doing paperwork and stuff like that so each kind of doctor there you find like has their own station they kind of like to work in um and that's basically what we do we do a little paperwork we get like stickers printed for um you know we'll be drawing blood heart blood femoral blood um we collect samples from the eyes we do uh, we take urine so we have to like sticker all these different bottles um that we'll be collecting samples in that are then sent we keep we keep some of them um you know for i think it's like five years or something oh. and and then the samples are tested upstairs in toxicology um as well I so agree. Yeah, every every county kind of has like a different jurisdiction for how long they keep samples. Um, we just keep like a little histo jar that just has like different samples of stuff um, uh, from from the organs like brain and liver, and they'll take like a little snippet of each organ and keep it like in a histo jar for like five years or ten okay. years or whatever. So if there's an autopsy on me after I die, there's going to be a little jar sitting somewhere with my name and the date on it of like my, yeah. my DNA, my, my whatever, my, my yeah. flu. Mm -hmm. That's weird. <laughs> um, yeah, I think it's just like, I don't, 
I don't know specifically why, like just in case, like later on something wants to be, re something needs to be retested. They have the samples there and they're not destroyed. Um, it's just right. like a statute of limitations for that. And each county kind of, I believe has their own um, kind of limit on that. But yeah, so um, where was I? We, then we kind of get the bodies. We, you know, we match the toe tags um to whatever number they're assigned <clears throat> and we bring them out the um everything is like they're secure the the rolling like racks that they basically are on are like secured into these spots so they can't just like float around the room um we photograph the bodies that's like the first thing that we do after we set up like everything that's going to be used by the doctors um, so we have to photograph like any tattoos, any, um, we photograph full body. Um, we do like an ID card photo. Um, we'll document any scars. Um, yeah, basically just photograph the whole body and the back. We have to roll them over and photograph their back. Um, and then, yeah, the doctor will come in and we'll kind of start to just assist them. So um, usually when they, they come in they, with the paperwork that they do, they document everything about the body. Um, how long was their hair? What color eyes? What condition are the teeth in? Just everything. They'll mark on the diagrams where the scars are, where the tattoos are. They'll draw a little diagram of everything. Um, and, and then they can say like, okay, you can open the body now. So it's our job to open the bodies which is this so the first time like I was kind of saying before like when I'm there just working as a scribe you can kind of tell yourself like oh this isn't real you, you haven't really partaken in it yet you know but the like the first time you like are involved in like touching them was like very surreal like all of a sudden I was like, you have, to have any like classes or anything first? You just, they just said, here, Dre, go ahead. I had to watch them a lot oh. and they're, they're talking me through it a lot before I start. And then when I do the first, like when I did my first Y incision, they're there watching me and, and guiding me through it, you know? Um, but we do a Y incision and like, do you really want to hear like all the, <laughs> <laughs> um, we do a wine incision from the shoulders and down basically to the pelvic bone, pelvic bone. <clears throat> um, then we kind of like cut the skin back as far close to the rib cage as possible. Um, this way the, well, first of all, it's, it's hard to cut the ribs when there's like muscle on the ribs so you kind of want to get as much of it away as possible and also that way the doctors can see if there was any fractures they can really see the bones they can feel the bones much better um then then we have to like cut the rib cage um we remove the rib cage and that's really crazy too <laughs> I think the first time was like pretty crazy. You, we use like just regular like tree loppers, you know, like. Oh, to cut, through the, to cut through the sternum or whatever? To cut through the ribs and then into the, like through the collarbone here. Oh, I thought there would be a, I thought there was a saw or something, some kind of power we, tool. We do use the saw <clears throat> for when we open the skulls. Oh. <laughs> I know. Um, but yeah, basically, and when, once we remove the, the rib cage, there's like a thin kind of like, a really thin kind of like casing around your organs that like keeps them all together. And like, this is important when you're like removing the rib cage to not like, to, to try to not cut into that. That way the doctor can see like, was there trauma in the heart that's, that's making this filled with blood? They can see like if there's anything um, that was like messed up ahead of time, if not from your own incision. So we use, um, you know, scalpels to kind of gently like cut away 
the rib cage. <sighs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> And then the doctor kind of goes and does the autopsy. Like, we're standing there if they need any help with anything, just watching. Like, mostly they're, like, explaining stuff while they're doing it. So it's really, mostly it's just really interesting. You know, like, the way the human body works is just so incredible. Like, you can see if someone had a stroke based on, like, how their brain looks. Like, when we cut through the brain, they do, like, incisions, like, every you know, half inch or something. So we're kind of like looking through the brain to see if there's any like abnormalities and you can see, oh, this person was, you know, had a stroke, look at how the, you know, the brain looks. I mean, obviously I'm still just like learning about that. I haven't even like gotten there yet, but just from like watching them, like it's, it's really interesting. <clears throat> That's wild. Uh, yeah. I feel weird right now. All right. It's all right. Um, so you're still doing that or no? Right now, because of the whole coronavirus thing, like right when I stopped um, working, I was there um, doing my internship for the first like couple days. When things kind of really started to gear up, they were like, okay, unfortunately, because you're not technically hired here, if you got sick while on the job, the county would be responsible for you. And basically like I could sue them. So they were like, since you're not technically a non-essential position, we're gonna have to like ask you to leave, which is like so heartbreaking because I feel like I always just want to help as much as possible. So, so now, for me, you're, now you're yeah. interning, so now you are getting school credit. Yeah, basically. I mean, it will definitely count towards like experience. Like if I tried to get a job as like an autopsy technician, like anywhere, you kind of need like one year of training. Right. So, like, I could basically <clears throat> um, get a job doing that, I'm sure. You ever think about um, combining all this study with your photography practice? Yeah. So, like, I feel like originally kind of how I got even interested in that, I mean, it kind of took a sharp, like, turn, like, at when I started doing autopsy work. I was like, oh, this is really interesting. Like, maybe this is kind of my path. Um, Cause there's, there's like a wholesomeness to it also, like as much as an autopsy is just like this really like harsh thing that's like happening to like a person, you know? Um, like for me, there's like a lot of humanity in it. Like I take great joy in like washing someone's body. Like some of the people we get in are, are homeless who have no families. And like, I get to be there to like, wash their bodies and like hold their hands and stuff and like treat them with like the utmost care that like no one's even going to know about you know but like for me I feel like I'm doing something good even if like they don't know it nobody knows it like I still feel like I'm helping even in death you know so sorry I just went off on a tangent I forgot even what I was like trying to say originally we we're talking about photography photography right um yeah, sorry. Originally, you know, you're, you know, one of my favorite photographers is Enrique Matinidez, and he lo and he was like shooting crime scene photos like all through the like late sixties and seventies and eighties, and um, it's so interesting to like see these photos. You're like, I want to shoot that, like car crashes, like you know. I think it kind of spawned from like some weird fucked up time of, of like finding like rotten.com as like a teenager and you're like ah you see like train crash pictures and stuff like that and it kind of like mm -hmm. is you have a hard time like looking away from that even if it's like just awful you know the element of like surprise to it or whatever can be like just really intriguing but you know I think I always kind of thought like oh if you know doing crime scene photos like yeah, I would totally get wild pictures, but it's, that's not really real anymore. You can't really just, you can't really put a picture of like, a, you know, a, an accident scene. Like you can't just 
have that for yourself and make art with it and make money off it or whatever, you know, that's not really, you can't really do that anymore. Like back in the eighties and nineties, like maybe, you know, I was just looking at, um, a lot of those photographers were news photographers or they worked for the police department or for the, um, fire department, you know? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Like I was just looking at, um, and that was their, that was their evidence, you know, before they had like, um, that was their whole evidence was the photo, the photos. Yeah, for sure. Before the and, science, you know? Yeah. And I think it, it, like a lot of the time it was the responsibility of the coroners who were like going to the scene, um, who are also like doing the autopsies, like in small towns, they have to do like all of the work themselves. They don't have like a team of people going there and like documenting stuff for them and then it's getting like catalog it was just like them with a camera you know and then there's like a dark room in the back that they're like developing the pictures in mm -hmm. and so they kind of just had this like stockpile of stuff but now it's very like everything is documented everything is on a database somewhere every every time you touch something if there were sign your name on it so there's like a good um you know chain of command of like where who is responsible for taking these photos where are they going so that they're not just ending up on the internet um you know there's a lot of like laws now that protect people like that you know um i don't think anybody really wants pictures of themselves like on the internet when you're dead that's like it sounds awful so there's a good reason for it for sure um it was different back then definitely yeah, like yeah said, I was they process Ouija, he would process his photos in the trunk of his car or in a hotel room or whatever, you know. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I was um talking to Grant Lewandowski and him and his brother, they right their grandfather was a coroner like in Indiana, a small town in Indiana. And they just put out a book of called Pathology of photos of his of slides that he had because he would go, he was like the coroner there who would like do all the autopsies and stuff. So he would come and take photos and they were just like sitting in a box, like, and that's just kind of how it was like back in the day, you just like, oh yeah, the, the pictures of the scene are just chilling in a box somewhere in the back that anybody could just like dig through in their garage. Yeah. Um, so I think originally I kind of was like, it's, it's hard to, I'm finding it kind of difficult to join the two aspects of my life. I thought it would be like much easier like oh you go you do a ride along you get to the scene and you're like can take pictures but it's like it's not really like that you know you can't it's not just like Jill Friedman jumping in the back of a cop car and like being on the scene like that's yeah. but then on the other hand there is like you know now in this day and age like people are just you want to videotape everything so it's like people on a scene are just like live leaking fucking anything you know Right, right. Um, so I don't know there is kind of this delicate balance of like are you a spectator are you a participant like what's your involvement I mean obviously when you work in law enforcement in, a, in the realm of law enforcement you're really responsible for that so you definitely just don't want to do anything that would like jeopardize your your standing just make you unreliable um, you know and just have your motives really questioned so it's like, you have to just be serious about it. You know, like it's, I even feel weird, like taking a picture of my scrubs in the bathroom. I'm like, oh, you know, like, um, but like whatever, obviously. Um, so it's, I just kind of had to make the, you know, just, oh, this is, you just don't take photos. It's just not how, you know, or if you do, they're going straight like into a case file and that's where they kind of just, have to live if you're going to take your job seriously for sure for sure totally totally get that so how yeah. much um how much school do you have left or i guess oh my you god know, you know what you want to do right i know i'm still i'm still kind of all over the place it's gonna be a long time so like i'll probably with city college and then you got to choose a college from there right basically yeah but it could be like if I wanna if I wanna do forensic science, I still have to complete like um, more like it would be a couple more semesters at city. Or if I wanna do go a criminal justice route and then like later decide 
that I want to do forensic science, you know, I would have to go back and like retake, I would have to take like prerequisite classes, like biology one, you know, which I like, you have to take if you're going to go into any science class. It's like heavy biology, heavy math and chemistry. Um, so it kind of depends. I don't know. Just thinking about it now, I think I, for me personally, I think I would go with the science route. You know what I mean? Like I yeah. like the idea of, you know, this particular evidence can make a break or make or break a case, you know? For sure. There's like, there's an intersecting point of like, being involved in in helping that like I always wanted to do like you hear all these cases there's all these like tv shows and stuff about like the evidence was like fucked it wasn't collected correctly at the scene yeah, and like fun. people are going to jail for like lifetimes for shit that like or was not, like or not going to jail or not going to jail you know yeah. like somebody overlooked something and this person stayed committing crimes for like 30 years or whatever it is yes. or you know i think i mean even worse somebody goes to jail for something they didn't do and yeah. like that's it's that is definitely like worse than someone just out there you know the you have to give the benefit of the doubt but um that's kind of something I always thought, like, I, I want to be at the forefront of, like, making sure that realm is, like, just so much, like, I wanted to have a part in, like, making sure that there was, like, better crime scene investigators, that, like, people were getting correct training, like, a lot of places, the police, they just, you can just sign up to do CSI, you don't have to take any kind of like training. You're like, Oh, I already, I'm already a cop. I already did the like, blah, blah, blah. But th that it's totally different of like why you need to be like photographing something a certain way, why you need to be like collecting certain samples. And I think I always was interested in, and, you know, wanted to be part of like making sure that people weren't just going in jail on like willy nilly, Mm -hmm. evidence you know like how can you say this person was involved were they really involved make sure you get everything that would say so right. um or say that they weren't involved you need the evidence to show that they also were not involved um so it i don't kills, know I, it kills me when you're watching something and the evidence is good evidence but it's inadmissible yeah the laws around admiss admiss admissibility are like they get tricky for sure. That's yeah. like, Kills you, me. yeah, definitely. You're like, oh, but but sh yeah, that person said they were gonna. We have it on video. We have it on whatever. We recorded it. We um, video inadmissible because the the person didn't know the plaintiff didn't know they were being recorded. So yeah, I feel like that. Yeah, um, you definitely have to make sure you have all your ducks in a row for that stuff. And that's something that they have to learn, like in the police academy, like if you, you know, like with warrants and stuff like that, you need to make sure the warrants are like good before you just go into a house and find the gun that like was responsible for something. You know what I mean? Like you can't, if not, if you went in without the correct warrants or whatever, you can't even use that evidence. So it's, it's really massively important to just like, make sure the each step that you're doing is like good and correct and for the right reasons and um or else the whole thing is pointless you know um but yeah i just think there's there's so many cases where like evidence got fucked up got left in the car nobody signed off for this the bag got ripped like they they missed something you know or like they people just don't care you know, I feel like there's like a lot of just like, they've been doing it for so long. They just think they know everything. They're, it's so blase, you know, they're just like, it's not a fun job. I don't think it's not a pretty job. You know, it's definitely something you have to be like dedicated to do it. You have to want, you have to have like a better reason to do it. Just like it was the only job I could get without a college degree, you know, which is like crazy that you could actually do CSI work without even having a college degree i think that's pretty wild but yeah that is wild um i mean there's certain states you can just literally like graduate high school and just be like i want to be the coroner of this town and you're like what 
I don't know. Um, you have to have your motives in the right place and have the dedication to do it, you know? Yeah. But. Wow, so intense. So proud of you. Yeah. Thanks, Ray. I know it, it is intense. Like sometimes. It's a lot, you know? Yeah, for sure. Well, it's hard too, because it's like, I'll get home from like a crazy morning, you know, and I'll just be like, like, damn, I wish I could talk to somebody about this or something, you know? It's like, you can't, huh? Not really. I mean, you okay. know, it's one thing like. Here's something that I don't know if we talked about. Maybe we did just a little bit, but I was on a job months ago with Will Manville. Uh -huh. And on the job, you were, he was texting with you. Uh -huh. And he was saying that you were in the middle or, or had just performed an autopsy on a four-year-old boy. Uh -huh. And I was like, oh, my God. Yeah. Can you talk about that? Or, or how, um, how was that? Just about the experience of, like, working with kids. That or the, even the case or? You know. um, that case, there, there actually is a lawsuit about that case. So it's, you kind of can't really get into the specifics of it. It was like a malpractice suit that had to do with dental work. Um, but, um, yeah, that was, that was a really sad day for sure. That was a really heavy day. I definitely, whenever there's kids real heavy, super silent in the autopsy suite, yeah, it's it so gets, sad. it is sad. I mean, a lot of the people that work there have families, um, and have kids and stuff. So it's always like a really tough time when, when we work with kids. Um, yeah, <laughs> it's kind of, I know you can't talk about the case, but it sounds like if it's a malpractice thing that it's like, you, you it's up to you guys to find the evidence yep. of malpractice or of something else. We had to bring in a forensic odontologist for that case specifically. He came and did x-rays of um of the decedent's mouth and you know did did a lot of work like on was the procedures that were being done was this necessary work um why was this being done you want to just figure out like why was this being done on somebody who was so young um and so yeah that was that's basically what we're looking for. You know, like what were the circumstances around why this child was getting these procedures done? Um, right. Or did he have a heart attack during it or something? Or, you yeah. Know. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's so intense. Yeah. I mean, it, a lot of, um, you know, deaths that happen around dental procedures is um, a complication with the anesthesia. So that's like something. Um, you know, you have to like test the levels, um, blood levels and stuff like that and and really check everybody's credentials. Like, was this person certified? There's a lot of like detective work that goes into, um, you know, then like investigating these, these uh, anybody who is involved um, that could be responsible, you know. That's a lot. Yeah. Okay. I still, I, I do have a lot of questions about that topic, but we could just go all day. You know what I mean? Yeah, for sure. I know there's. How is your day? How have your days been? Cause this quarantine is kind of nuts, right? It is. Uh, you're, you're still in school. You're doing all your shit online now, huh? Mm -hmm. This semester I was just doing online work anyway. So for me, nothing changed. I've just still been doing all my stuff online. Um, I'm the semester is about to be over this week. So excited. Party, party time? <laughs> yeah, I guess. Nothing really, like, yeah, I mean, I'll be glad to, like, not have to wake up and think, like, oh, shit, I have to, like, write an essay today <laughs> or, like, do an exam today, which, like, I basically have homework every, you know, every day, every other day. I have to, like, get on the computer and sit down and do it's a lot of reading and stuff like that. So yeah. I'll be glad 
like four classes full load? No, right now, right now I'm just doing psychology and sociology, but it is a lot of reading. You know, it's a lot of reading, a lot of writing. Um, super interesting though. Yeah. Um, but it is, yeah, it's been, it's been good. I think I'm, I also kind of have this weird, like, blessing in disguise mentality around this whole like quarantine thing you know I feel like for the past couple of years I've always thought like just prayed like oh god if I only had like a couple months of like time standing still completely <laughs> where like I could just handle all this stuff I want to do like mountain of clothes that have holes that need sewing or like I want to organize all my blah blah whatever like home projects and just like shit I want to do like pu like I love doing puzzles so for me this is like who's got time to ever do a puzzle in the real world like no one ever you're like working in school like doing this and that and that it's like for you know, like this is like a nice mental break to be like oh man I get to do a puzzle today I get to work on like a hard puzzle like for me for my mind that's like really great I'm like catching up on all these things like I get to read I get to like you know, I've just been like running and like getting some energy out and I feel the opposite. Work. Like I can't get anything going. I mean, well, <laughs> I'll be, pro I'll, it comes in waves, right? Like I'll be pr productive for a week and then I'll have another week where I just don't want to do anything. Like I can't open a book. I can't open my, even my computer. Like I just feel like so unmotivated and yeah. kind of bored and whatever, you know? Yeah. I definitely go in waves too, but I'm, I'm somebody who I, I feel like I always need to have like a schedule, some kind of structured like thing about my day. Even if there's only like one thing I have to do in my day, I'll kind of like build, I'll have that one thing and I'll like build around it. So it's like, before I have that one thing, I'll like take a shower or I'll like, oh, I should do my laundry first before I do that one thing. And then after that, then I'll have like, this thing so I'll kind of set up I'll just like break my day up and I just need wow. to have like structure yeah. or else it's like I don't know I feel like I just have to be doing something all the time yeah. you know that's what's weird is like for me I'm always pr a productive dude I always have stuff to work on and I've yeah. kind of like prided myself on that like I just always am doing something working on something yeah. I always have like a stack of little projects I have but now like when I actually have like so much time to, to stare at them and work on them. I, I don't want it. <laughs> I yeah. don't know. I don't know why, you know? Yeah, for sure. I know. Same. There's still like big projects that I'm <laughs> just totally avoiding that. Like just thinking about them right now. I'm like, ah, but. Well, it does feel like, um, I mean, I don't think things will go completely back to normal, but it sounds like things are going to start opening up this week, the next couple weeks. And I'm excited to go to the beach again. Yeah, yeah. Has the beach been closed in in LA? Yeah. The beach has been closed. I mean, people are like sneaking down to Huntington Beach and stuff, but um, I haven't had a chance. Yeah. It's just like, I keep, it's like, part of me is like, oh yeah, I wish, I want things to open. Whatever. I never really went out anyways. So for me, there's not like, I miss like restaurants. I miss going to like restaurants for sure, but like, yeah I'm not there like eager to go to the club and shit or whatever or like even to the beach like I don't I don't even I don't fuck with the sun so I don't even go to the beach that much but um so for me like not that much changes like I do miss being at work and like working with my friends but yeah. um it is a little worrisome to see this like rush to get everything back open when there's like a 45 percent rise in some states that have already opened opened or whatever yeah you what's, know, your, like, what's your what's your whole do you have productions or vibes about it like do you think there's gonna be a second wave um do you think there's gonna be a third wave do you think they what how do you feel about the economy what you have what do you think <laughs> man this shit is never gonna fucking end unless we just like do the things that like are recommended of us to do like the hard thing for people mentally is to say okay we're like we're flattening the curve and so in people's minds they're like dude no one's sick i don't even no no this isn't even real because like no you know no one's even sick and it's like no 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 it's no one's really getting sick because we're it's working like not a lot of people are dying because like what we're doing is working and it's hard to like get that into people's minds that like 
what you're doing is a good thing and you should keep doing it like stay strong and keep just staying at home keep wear a fucking mask like whatever you know like if you're gonna go out um and it's hard for people to like see that you know just like just like when you're looking on it at a scene, you're looking for the evidence that there was no crime. You know, you're looking for the 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 void of evidence. That right. is also something you're like looking for. So it's like these people they're they're not seeing that like them not going out is actually making the difference. So everybody's kind of like, oh, nothing, it's fine, like it's not that bad. When really it's like everyone's gonna go out, and then we're probably gonna see a surge. You know, like. You think I so? You your I think that's the thing, though. It's like people. I think that, it'll just keep going in waves. It's just going to keep going in waves. Then we're going to have to do this again. Everybody's going to have to stay home because, like, we're doing it too early or whatever. You know, like well, until the, there's yeah. the evidence you speak of. You know, I, when, in people's heads, here's what I think is happening. But I, I just read about this. Yeah. So the, the numbers aren't adding up, right? So, the, so they're telling us this many people are sick, this many people are dying, but it's just not adding up. Like, cause nobody, um, I don't know very many people that caught it. I don't know anybody that died from it, stuff like that. So like when they tell you like, oh, in your particular part of town, you know, thousands of people got it and died. And you're like, wait a minute, you know, <clears throat> not that I know thousands of people in my little part of town, but whatever um the numbers aren't adding up but then i just read this you, you know how they're they're just saying like you could die of just symptoms of coronavirus so they'll mark your death as coronavirus like, mm -hmm. you, like you could just have a cough or uh so there's so there's all, all these conspiracies about why they're lying about the death toll but then i just read this thing it's well it's like the hospitals only get money if they're in an area of high Corona deaths, uh -huh. they got money, supplies, et cetera, et cetera. So a lot, so a lot of these hospitals that are half empty, having to send people home because there's nobody in them, um, they still the, the hospitals don't want to go bankrupt. So to get that money, they have to report um, a certain number of deaths. I guess I don't know what the mm. the the quota is but hmm. so that's kind of an interesting way to look at why the numbers are so uh inflated hmm. yeah that's that is interesting um that uh, i feel like that's could probably be true i mean obviously you have to like look at your sources who's releasing this information are they reliable you know where are they getting this information from? There's yeah. just a lot of spread of like, people just spread things on the internet. You really need to like do your own research of like, is this, is this source credible? Do they have, you know, where are they getting their information from? Like you also have to kind of be a detective in your own right, as far as like what information you're willing to believe. Why are you willing to believe it? You know, like I have a pretty high standard for like reading the news and like, saying is this source reputable like i'm not just gonna see some headline on fucking instagram and be like oh dude i heard it's like no i'm gonna have to go and find that article who's writing it where are they getting their information from um I but agree. i mean that, that you know that's the problem of the world people aren't doing their own research and making up their own mind and making up their own opinions and so many people like nobody knows how to like think that way yeah. you know um which is just that i mean that's definitely how like false information can spread so easily and how just like dumb shit online people are just so willing to just believe whatever headlines they, oh buzzfeed told me it's like buzzfeed <laughs> I, you know what i mean like i don't know i'm just like maybe i'll do my own research into that but i mean that is true like Right now, BuzzFeed's gonna come after us, Trey. Thanks. I know. Sorry. <laughs> um, I'm just trying to give you like a, you know. Um, teach me something. T t tell me something. Teach me something. <laughs> <laughs> Learn me something. I'm just, yeah. I don't know. I, it's hard. It's hard for me to go on and read the news right now because I am very skeptical about everything I read. You know, I'm like, it's, it's also hard in this day and age because even the scientists aren't agreeing on the information. 
that's, I think, what is, like, the scariest thing is that, like, not all these different branches of science are, like, agreeing on certain facts and like that for me breeds like weird fear i'm like okay if the scientific community can't agree with each other on certain things then like that's when i'm kind of just like okay who do who can you trust or who's where is the real where does the real truth lie um for me that's like the scariest thing you know it's like when you see these different reports from these like really reputable like you know they're writing like scholarly journals scientific journals about this information and and each thing has like competing information in it you're just kind of like damn now now where do we go from here like that's what i'm saying no one knows fucking nothing about nothing yeah uh, that's why i'm kind of just like i'm kind of just like we don't really know i just have to keep thinking that like we don't really know every day they're just trying to learn more about it every day is like just a learning experience for everybody yeah. like who's really involved not just about this about everything i think yeah for sure i don't know anything <laughs> me neither <laughs> fuck i know i'm just i stay not knowing stuff but i'm trying to you know but that's i think that's the place to be because then you're constantly learning you're, you're trying to learn you're trying to figure it out you know what i mean yeah yeah for sure like once you're like i know everything about everything you're done you know what i mean you're done <laughs> yeah you just put a cap on yourself you know yeah totally um yeah, that's no way to live, thinking that you know stuff. I like to think that I don't know anything. Lots of people like this, and it's gets really sure. sometimes. I like to stay thinking that I really don't know anything. That way I'm always open to, like, learning new things. And then I, you can bounce it off of, like, the information you think you already know. You know, you're, like, learning something, and it keeps you, like, open to, like, new interpretations of shit you already thought you knew. Like, it's good to, it's good to, like, learn something but then always keep that door kind of just cracked a little bit so you don't have to close the door like oh i know all the things about that topic because you can always go back and just be like actually did i really know everything or did i just think i knew <laughs> yeah i mean it's a ego, it's a kind of an ego check you know yeah yeah for sure okay nice to see you it's nice to see you too, Ray. I miss you so much. Miss you too. Um, is there anything else you'd like to say? I think we had a pretty good long combo. I know. I, it's funny because you were, you were asking me to kind of go through the steps of the autopsy and then we kind of stopped halfway through. I didn't even get through oh. the whole autopsy. Oh, you didn't? Did I, I mean, whatever. Like after they, you know, like we didn't get to the head or after what you do with the bodies when you sew them up. There's yeah. so much. We'll do, an, we'll do an episode two of, like, the continuation. You know what? We stopped at, um, you just cut open the chest, and we just look at, we're looking at the casing, if it's full of blood or not. That's where we stopped. <laughs> we can save that one for, like, an episode two. I'll, I'll go through from uh, there. I think I got a little weirded out. Maybe subconsciously I diverted the convo. It is, it is a lot. It definitely takes a certain... <laughs> I, I really thought you were just going to be like, boom, boom, boom. And then that was going to be it. But you, you, you went into like um, the deep, the, the real deets. I asked if you wanted to hear. I'm like, do you want to really hear this? You're like, yeah. I thought it was like five steps. And then you, you went on to like a hundred steps. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't know how in depth you wanted me to get into it. People like hearing. Right now, or should we just do part two? We'll do like a part two. There's really nothing after that. <laughs> Okay, check the, weigh the organs, see if they're all spotted with, you know, cigarette smoke, and then cut the brain, cut the, brain, cut the top, the skull, the skull in half, dig out the, the eyes and the tongue and the brain. Yeah. Pretty much. You leave the eyes, but yeah, uh, yeah. It's pretty much, you're right. Okay. Do, you don't put nothing back, huh? Or do you? All of the organs, after they've been dissected, they get put into, the, the doctor's like dissecting them, we look through them, and then they're put into like a plastic, 
bag, a big, thick kind of plastic bag. We zip tie the bag at the end of the procedure and we put it into the chest cavity. Oh. And then we put the rib cage back on. So like basically like in your, after you die, like in your, like where all your organs would be, there's just kind of like a bag of all your organs. Why would they use plastic though? Because the body's going in the ground or getting cremated, right? Yeah. Maybe you could suggest like a different material. What would you suggest? Well, sometimes. Because now those, because now like when worms are going through the body, now these worms got to digest plastic and all this stuff. Just environmental, you know, reasons. I, I, I hear you. I hear you. Um, yeah, they should make like a biodegradable like potato plastic bag that they use or something. I mean, I really, I think it's also, is that yeah, a, I don't know. Is a reason for that just to like keep it from the body from oozing out blood um, while you're at the funeral or whatever? you couldn't even have there's no way that you could just have the organs like it's just it has to be to because that because that stitching it the organs will just want to be like i mean kind of like when the body is open if you try to just put the organs kind of like back into it after i mean I i get that i get that just uh well, when we, after we do the autopsies, then the body will go to like a funeral home or be collected by the family. So like, it's their job to, um, yeah, I don't know what happens after that. Honestly, I don't. If they take the, like, they might take the organs and do something with that separately. I'm, I'm not sure. So open your stitching back up and be like. We do like a general stitching and they go through and they do like a really nice fine stitching if they're go- if they're going to have like an open casket funeral. Uh, you know, they make sure yeah. Oh, um, maybe so that maybe they, you know, transfer the organs out of that plastic bag. That is co- entirely possible. I'm not sure. I think everywhere might might be a little different too, you know. <laughs> I don't know how they do it. I've never worked in a funeral home, but I've always kind of wanted to. Uh, yeah, I don't know if I can do it seems seems creepier than what I do <laughs> in a certain way I don't know one um here's a weird personal story uh I went to my grandfather's funeral and uh, I had my camera you know I was taking pictures my aunt takes my camera I just had a t4 with me and she goes up to my grandpa's body and then just rattles off like a whole roll almost <laughs> And she was just having, she was having fun with it, you know? I mean, she also shot pictures of, like, some of the, um, you know, people hanging out. Yeah. Her, and members hanging out and stuff. But uh, so I have this role in my thing, in my collection, you know, or, or in my archives or whatever. That's uh, just. Just, like, almost a full role of, like, my grandfather in his casket, you know? <clears throat> Dang. It's trippy. I, I'm, I'm glad to have it, but also it's, I don't know weird it's weird that is that is a trip i remember um i've seen a couple dead bodies just like out like in life and experience um but i never had my camera like i never thought to like take a or you know what i mean like one was when i was like really young i saw a guy was like hit by a train and whatever you know didn't have your camera you're like kind of young um and then another one I saw a guy shot on mission but I whatever long story short um the when I was in Spain with Laura there was like we were at this like music festival thing kind of like out in like some big open field and big ass party and you could see kind of it was like out in this big field that's like totally dark you know we took a bus to get there and you could see like down on the road there was like a bunch of police cars and I was like something happened over there I'm gonna go over there and like see and of course I was like super drunk yeah 
and I walked out there like by myself, like down this road, pretending I'm just like walking. I don't know where they thought I thought I was going because there's nowhere to go. You're like out in the fucking woods, basically. And I remember trying to get a picture of this, whatever. There was like a guy there who was like hit by a car or something. Uh, you don't want that. And it was, no, it was like, the whole thing kind of scared me. I don't know. I felt weird about it. And the pictures didn't. The pictures didn't even turn out. They. I thought they were gonna break my camera straight up. The cops came running over. You know, they it'd were not. Be, it'd be different if you if you were SFPD though. You know what I mean, with the camera. Because that. Yeah. Be, you're because then you're doing a job. Then you're doing a job. There, I was just being. Yeah. I was or, just being or, an asshole. Or yeah, or if you're like New York Times or something. For sure. Like, I was just being young and dumb and, like, like now, like, learning through – just also, like, having the experience of, of, like, taking care of somebody who's dead. Like, you just have a lot of respect for them. Like, so this whole thing about, like, oh, yeah, I want to take pictures of, like, cr crime scenes. Like, later, you're like, damn, all these are real fucking people, <laughs> you know, that have, like, families and lives and shit. And, like yeah. – And like, I just feel like I developed so much more for like that whole experience. And like, I don't know. Now I, I don't really think that so much. Like I wouldn't go and just be like trying to get photos of like some fucked up scene. I'm just like, damn, right. I don't know. I know what you're saying. Yeah. Like when you're young, you kind of just want the like, oh, I would just want the wild, I just want the craziest pictures. And I'm just like, I think my mindset's totally different now. Yeah. But. <laughs> okay. well um anything else i think we'll do a part two huh yeah we'll do a part two okay i feel like now like now i have all these things i want to like research research up on you know oh, like, what? like making meth i don't know just like like more i don't know whatever <laughs> just stuff you know like photographers and like just the, his, just the history of like crime scene photography and I don't know jurisdiction laws and like just mental notes and I'm like oh I should research what states have different laws and like you know who um, Ouija is right yeah he's one of the OGs yeah the OG crime scene photographer for sure so sick he had such a knack for being in the right spot at the right time that's that's how he got his name Ouija yeah or like Ouija board, you know? Yeah. That's sick. That's a good way to get a name. Yeah. <laughs> For sure. Are, are you in these spots all the time, you know? <clears throat> yeah. I know. Well, it, you know, I don't know if you ever saw that series that it's, it's kind of stupid, but it was all about um, news. Uh, it's like the people that get the news clips and then they sell them to like news agencies or whatever. Okay. And there's like this crew of dudes like in LA and they each kind of have their own like business where they like listen to police scanners and they just like stay up all night, like driving around and they get to each crime scene. It's like whoever's there first gets the best footage. Right. And they then sell them to like all the news agencies, you know? That's so it'll be like, there's a series Oh. on that came out on netflix like last year a couple of years ago it's called like oh. something yeah. in the dark you know it's like i'll have to find it and send it to you um but i was like oh man i feel like i would be good at that too you know it's like you listening to it seems really hard it seems so tough you're yeah. there like listening to police scanners all night and but that's how you get like wild photos, even if you're not there right in the scene, you know, just even like, yeah. You know, yesterday, uh, the other day I saw um, uh, uh, like a big ass truck, you know, like a big ass tanker truck carrying like a container ship on the back or whatever, like a big truck. <laughs> Sorry, my brain's like, I had flipped over on the freeway on the overpass right before you get on the Bay Bridge. And it looked so crazy because it was like 
you have all these lanes of traffic, one overpass that's, it, it's on a curve. So it's slightly facing in your direction as you're driving. And this whole truck just fell. Oh. And it was wild. And it's like, that's the kind of, I'm like, oh, that's like a sick photo. It's Get just off. like a complete, and the cops had blocked oh, off yeah. the entrance. So there was no cars. It was just this big ass truck that's like hanging on the edge of the, it was wild. Was there cargo coming out? They had opened the back of it and I think they were like taking everything out. Um, yeah, I, don't, I couldn't see what, what was inside, but. One time I saw a UPS truck go sideways on, a, um, I mean, I didn't see it happen, but I saw yeah. a UPS truck on its side on the freeway and there was like a thousand packages on the street. Fuck. That's a tough, that yeah. sucks. Cause you got to reorganize all that and that stuff's like, Oh, it was getting ran, it was getting ran over by other cars. That's fucked up. With all your Amazon shit. <laughs> Man, Krush. So Krush. Okay, I gotta go. Okay. Thanks for hanging out with me today, though. Of course, right, right. Anytime. Glad to talk about anything you want to forever. Yeah. We're gonna do it again. Yeah. Once a week. I'm down. <laughs> yeah. Right. I, I'm not doing shit. Okay, okay, we're gonna do it again. I'm super down. Thanks for calling me and yes. thinking of me. For sure. Okay. Um, all right. Well, love you. Love you too. Have a nice day. Okay, you too. <laughs> okay. Bye bye. Bye.